I'd like to now talk about process of fertilization and the formation of early embryos. Basically, in the early times of interest in developmental biology, there were several people who proposed what was called a homunculus theory for the sperm, and what that involved was having a theory was, and that was back in the uh, 1600s, late 1600s, that the sperm contained a fully formed little human and or, or other mammal, and that this sperm would then go and serve as kind of a seed in the uh, ovum or in the body of the female, and a new individual would grow from that. And so that was a pretty popular theory for the next 150 or 200 years. And it wasn't until 1876 that Oscar Hertwig and Hermann Foll independently discovered that there was actually a fusion of the sperm and the egg and the sperm and the egg nuclei using the sea urchin um, model. That's the model that they were able to make this discovery in, given that the fertilization takes place outside of the body. And uh, they were able to prove then through some microscopy and microscopic observation that indeed a fusion takes place and that a new animal is formed in this way. There are four major events in the process of fertilization. The first event is to contact and recognize that the egg and sperm belong together. In other words, it's a contact and recognition between the sperm and the egg to ensure that the same species were involved. Regulation of the sperm into the egg, only one sperm nucleus could go into an egg to fertilize that egg, and there had to be a mechanism so that once the first sperm came in and fused with the nucleus particularly, uh, then uh, no other sperm could come in, or they couldn't come in uh, and be effective in terms of being a part of the fertilization process. There had to be, uh, in part three, a fusion then of the sperm and the egg, nucleus and the genetic material, and finally there had to be an activation of the egg to start development. Let's look at the modification of the germ cell to form a mammalian sperm, in this case illustrated in your uh, slide here. Here you can see the germ cell. It's a relatively undifferentiated cell. Nucleus is haploid, of course. There's a well-developed Golgi apparatus. Mitochondria, there's a centriole that's going to give rise to microtubules and a flagella. There also will be, as development progresses, the acrosomal vesicle and granule starts to form. The centriole begins to form a flagellum, and that flagellum will continue to grow as the maturation of the sperm continues. The Golgi apparatus will enlarge to form eventually into a, an acrosomal vesicle by fusing and forming the membranes will form lysosomes that contain lytic uh, vacuoles, lytic, lytic bodies. Microtubules will form from two places, one from the central part of the centriole, and also microtubules will start to form from the peripheral aspects of the other centriole. And finally, as development progresses, the cytoplasm begins to elongate. Mitochondria line up against the uh, tail, the nucleus further elongates, the tail becomes extended beyond the cytoplasm, and the maturation takes place. Here we can see in the somewhat mature sperm, it's not totally immature to the point where it could actually fertilize an egg yet, but we, would, uh, we will come across that uh, as we go forward in some of the other slides. Uh, here's the acrosomal vesicle. It's basically a large lysosome that has lytic enzymes that will dissolve through the jelly coat and the other membranous layers of the, uh, of the egg coat. Here's the sperm cell membrane, the haploid nucleus. So this in total then is the sperm head, including the centriole, which will give rise to the flagellar axonemes and also the microtubules. There are mitochondria that surround that, uh, the beginning of that uh, sperm tail. It's in the midpiece region and uh, it extends into the sperm tail end, and then there's an end piece. So these are a couple of examples. This is a bull sperm. Um, here you can see the nuclear area, which is stained blue. You can see the mid piece, mainly mitochondria, that are stained green. And here we see the tail piece, where the tubulin is stained red. So this is a bull sperm, a mammalian sperm. Here's a mouse sperm in which the acrosome 
is appearing green because of a green fluorescent protein that has been incorporated into uh, that component of the sperm head. If we look in cross-section now at the sperm, you can see that here we can look in cross-section. We see the, uh, the axoneme the, that is really the modal part of the sperm tail. There's some rigid proteinaceous material that form uh, rigid strands that extend the length of the tail. And if we look at the details, these are some things that you, I'm sure, have come across in your cell biology or your general biology courses, for that matter, cell membrane, radial spokes, various kinds of extensions of the arm, the inner and outer dynein arms, and so forth. And then there are protofilaments that compose the microtubule doublet. This now is the structure of a sea urchin egg at fertilization. You can see that the uh, sperm have started to go into the uh, jelly layer. They're extending down toward the patellan em envelope. They're eventually, one of them will uh, penetrate and fuse with the cell membrane. There are cortical granules inside that cell membrane, and those are important to prevent polyspermy, and we'll see a little bit about that later on. Here's the nucleus, the haploid nucleus of the egg in this case, and there are mitochondria that will have various roles in oxidative metabolism of this egg and actually continuing to have the egg uh, built up and get ready for forming into a new individual. You, you should realize that the mitochondria that an individual has comes totally from the egg. So the mitochondrial component that's in a mammalian or any vertebrate body particularly will come from the uh, mitochondria. This actually though shows the structure of the sea urchin egg at fertilization. The egg, all of the materials really necessary for early growth are in that egg and they must be stored in the egg. Unlike the sperm that discards most of the cytoplasm, the ovum or egg accumulates more at ma as it maturates so that it can maintain early development. The egg stores such things as nutritional proteins, uh, nutritive proteins that will keep the embryo going during, during the early phases of cell division. There are ribosomes and ribosomal RNA, mitochondrial RNA will also be in the mitochondria, but there will be messenger RNA as well as transfer RNA. These RNAs are activated at fertilization to synthesize the needed proteins for development. There are also morphogenetic factors. There are transcription factors and paracrine factors that will actually direct early development. And there are protective chemicals that are put in place in the ovum. There are protective factors that are present in the egg. For example, antibodies, ultraviolet filters, so that uh, the sun shining on the ocean, for example, in, a, in the case of a sea urchin egg, will not destroy the uh, nucleic acid content. There are various distasteful flavors that will discourage potential predators from coming and eating the eggs. The pronucleus, as I mentioned before, is haploid. The cell membrane uh, has an intercellular envelope. It's got a cortex. There are microvilli on the eggs, and that's important. The microvilli are important because that's how the sperm becomes directed to the egg initially. And as I mentioned earlier, the cortical granules will swell and cause uh, an influx of water at the fertilization, the point of fertilization, and not allow other spermatozoa to enter the egg. So it reduces the chance for polyspermy, although polyspermy under certain conditions can take place. And when that does happen, the embryo simply doesn't survive, usually. Well, usually does not survive. So if we look at the stages of maturation then, of egg maturation at the time of sperm entry, they are different in different animals. If we look at the primary oocyte model, here we see a number of animals that will have fertilization take place when the ovum is in the stage of a primary oocyte. Most of these are invertebrates, they're worms, uh, mollusks, but also, interestingly, dogs and foxes and some of the other carnivore group uh, will have the primary oocyte fertilized, and so there's an early fertilization of the ovum in those species. Those that have fertilization take place at the first metaphase 
also include a number of worms, most of the insects, actually, and such uh, echinoderms as starfish and some of the other related marine invertebrates. Second metaphase, that's the most common among the vertebrates. The second metaphase, all of the mammals virtually, except for those individuals that were involved in the primary oocyte, the dogs and foxes and other canines, but most all of the mammals, fish and amphibians, have fertilization take place during the second metaphase. And and those uh, organisms where the female pronucleus has become totally haploid, in other words, meiosis is complete, fertilization actually takes place, would be such uh, organisms as sea anemones and the sea urchins. In fact, the urchins are the first organisms that were really pretty well studied and are most well understood of all the entire animal kingdom. If we look at the sea urchin fertilization, we can see in the left figure, figure A, this is a scanning electron micrograph. The vitellin membrane is torn, as you can see, and this unfertilized egg then shows the granular and microvilli visible. You can barely see it in the scanning electron micrograph, but they're obviously visible in uh, micrograph B, where the microvilli you can see will extend off of the inside of the egg membrane. The vitellin envelope is clo closely associated with that, and there is a cortical granule, which is primarily uh, mucopolysaccharides and glycoproteins and glycopolysaccharides, and that will more or less explode at the time of fertilization in the sense that it will release its contents and cause an influx of a significant amount of water to swell the membrane and make it a fertilization membrane. The cortical granules are basically homologous to the acrosome in the sperm. This is what is a major factor in preventing polyspermy. If we look at the mammalian egg immediately before fertilization, here we can see the hamster egg, which is in figure A, which is encased in a zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is kind of is a clear area around there, and uh, the polar body is visible at uh, one end of the ovum. This is a hamster egg. If we look at the right figure, there's a mouse oocyte at much lower magnification. It's surrounded by a cumulus oophorus, which has been stained with carbon particles, and so that's what the black area is around the outside. That's carbon, India ink. It makes better photography so that you can see, and it does stain some of the particulate matter surrounding the ovum, as well as the cellular material in the cumulus oophorus. In figure 4.8 here that's illustrated, this is a summary of events leading to the fusion of egg and sperm membranes. Again, in the sea urchin, uh, this is an external version of fertilization, and it's the one that has been most studied and was studied early. Basically, the sperm contacts the jelly layer, and this is done chemotactically. It's attracted to the egg of the same species, and we'll see in a few minutes that this is because of some factors that are present in the jelly coat layer and in the vitellin envelope. The sperm contacts the jelly layer. The centriole, you can see, is present, as are the other structures that are labeled in this diagram. There's the acrosome, actin, the nucleus, uh, centriole, as well as the tail. The acrosome reaction will uh, send out actin filaments that will extend to the front of the sperm as it's penetrating into the egg jelly and it triggers that acrosome reaction that also releases the acrosomal enzymes. You see the acrosome is that huge lysosome that contains proteolytic enzymes, and it will begin to just away the jelly material so that the sperm is able to penetrate through the jelly layer to eventually reach the vitellin envelope as well as the egg cell membrane and fuse with that egg cell membrane. Initially, there's a binding to the vitellin envelope, as you can see, uh, number four. And finally, the sperm adheres to the egg cell membrane, fuses with it, and the sperm pronucleus can now enter the egg cytoplasm so that there can be a fusion of the egg pronucleus with the sperm pronucleus. This is an actual photograph of fertilization in the sea urchin. And initially, 
what's done in this particular experiment. The sperm and egg are shed into the ocean, but of course this is in a, a petri dish. And what they do is they, they are adding sperm, which will then start to become active, and it will begin to be drawn to the eggs through chemotaxis. The main mechanism of sperm being attracted to the eggs is uh, some chemicals that are called RESAC, and they're really short polypeptide chains that are present in the egg jelly coat, and so specific species of sea urchin will attract the specific sperm from that same sea urchin. Sea urchin sperm from other species, although they're closely related species, will not uh, be activated. They will not be uh, attracted to those particular jelly coats that contain that resect peptide. The chemotactic peptides in the sea urchin sperm basically released from the egg, from the jelly in particular, go to a receptor on the sperm membrane. As you can see here in uh, A, this activates the receptors and it will set off a chain reaction of GTP to GMP creating a positive environment and it will open the calcium channels and it will allow a rapid influx of the calcium into the inside of the sperm body and once the calcium in the sperm is increased this will cause the species of sperm to, well, it, it's species specific in the sperm, but it will cause the sperm to become very active and that the red shows the highest level of calcium in the sperm, whereas the blue is uh, uh, the lowest, but it will activate the sperm and it will cause the sperm to become active in terms of setting off a variety of events which will cause the sperm to begin uh, swimming and becoming uh, strongly active toward attempting to penetrate through the egg membrane. The acrosome reaction in sea urchins, as you can see here on the top panels, are diagrammatic and the lower are electron micrographs. But you can see that the bindin, bindin is a chemical which is going to bind actually to the egg membrane, is at the bottom of the acrosomal membrane and just at the front end of the globular actin, which will become activated when the calcium comes into the sperm that we saw previously. And if you look below, you can see in panel A that the nucleus is still intact and the acrosomal membrane's intact, but as it progresses toward the right of the slide, there's an opening of the acrosomal membrane. The acrosomal enzymes are released so that they can begin to digest away the jelly coat, and in doing so, then the actin will polymerize. The actin microfilaments will form from the G-actin, and that will send this penetrating sort of spear forward, led by um, the sperm membrane that has bindin associated with it, and that will then eventually bind to the egg membrane so that it can penetrate and fertilization will eventually take place. Now, I mentioned that there was species-specific binding of the ac acrosomal process to the egg surface in sea urchins, and here's an experiment which illustrates that. The species-specific binding is illustrated by taking the bindin particles from one species, which is perporatus, and putting the eggs from the same species, the eggs in which the jelly coats have been removed, and you can see that the bindin particles from that particular species will bind those eggs together. And in the case of bindin particles from another species, they will not bind the eggs together. And the opposite is true then with the other species, Franciscanus. No agglutination takes place, however, if the same species is mixed together, both the bindin particles and the eggs, agglutination will take place, and that shows how the sperm will actually bind to the eggs of the same species. And if we looked, look at the receptors on the sea urchin egg, this is a scanning electron micrograph A, which shows many sperm that are bound to the surface of that egg. But if you look at the surface, you can see areas in which there are no sperm, and even though there's room for sperm, there are some bare areas in there. So why aren't there sperm on those areas? Well, the 
theory is that in this case, there must be binding membrane sites, binding receptors, in other words, on these sea urchin eggs. And if we look at also in B now, we can see that this shows the sperm that is attracted to beads that contain the binding coating on them. So those beads have binding coating and the sperm will actually be activated by those beads with the binding coating. And if we look and see, we can see that there's a diaminobenzidine precipitate uh, with an antibody against bindin, which will um, basically uh, stain the bindin particles on the acrosomal process of the sperm. The graph in D basically illustrates quantitatively uh, what we have just described. Here we see um, electron micrographs of the entry of sperm into to the sea urchin eggs. If we look at A, we see uh, acrosomal process has basically come forward and has come in contact with one of the microvilli of the sperm head. And so that acrosomal process has been, has identified the proper egg which to bind to. And then with progressing development of this fertilization process, the ovum will send out a uh, process which will begin to engulf and fuse with the sperm, photograph B, and in photograph C, the sperm has actually uh, begun to enter into the ovum. Those are microvilli on the surface of the ovum, and if you look at the sperm, you can see the sperm burrowing into the egg. Here's the tail of the sperm. This is a transmission electron micrograph now. Here's the nucleus of the sperm, and it's going in. It's fused with the membrane of the egg, and now you can see the sperm membrane and sperm membrane and egg membrane are fused together, and the nucleus is now entering the egg.